Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another video in my history series. I wasn't actually planning on filming this particular video this month, I had something else entirely to film, but I feel like this is a very apt story to tell right now, especially considering the whole anti-tabloid hashtag be kind movement currently happening in the UK. Marie Antoinette is possibly one of the earliest victims of tabloid gossip, or at least what would have been the 18th century's version of tabloid gossip. All of France was talking about her and not in a positive light. I mean, you know Marie Antoinette hit the headlines when she's still a name known by pretty much everyone even today in 2020. To this day, Marie Antoinette is one of the most divisive people in France. She is still equally loved and hated. The last Queen of France before the French Revolution. As always, this video is sponsored by Magellan TV. As you probably know, we have an ongoing sponsorship and I know that so many of you have already signed up to Magellan TV. So today I'd like to make my documentary recommendations first. Today I'm going to be recommending Malaria the Serial Killer. I've briefly touched on this in my video I did on the Black Plague, but I am fascinated by infectious diseases. I absorb all the media I can about disease. So the fact that I was going to love this documentary was already kind of a given. It explores the disease's current status in the world and talks to specialists about their research and experiences with malaria. And it was just as fascinating as you would expect. And the second documentary I'm going to recommend today is Secrets of the Magna Carta. I don't know if British kids still learn about the Magna Carta in school today. I would have covered it in year eight, I think about 13 years ago. And I wish this documentary was around then because it's a lot more interesting than my history teacher was. For those of you who haven't signed up yet, Magellan TV is a streaming service dedicated purely to documentaries. I advocate education and bettering yourself and your knowledge at every opportunity, so I really cannot recommend Magellan TV enough. They have everything from true crime to science, history, nature, and everything in between. And new programs are added weekly that can be watched anywhere on your TV, laptop, and mobile. It's compatible with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Google Play, and iOS, and loads of the programs are also available in 4K. Definitely check Magellan TV out if you love documentaries as much as I do. So Marie Antoinette was actually born Maria Antonia Josepha Joanna on the 2nd of November 1775 at the Hofburg Palace in Vienna, Austria. I suppose that's the first thing that most people don't know about Marie Antoinette. She wasn't even French, she was Austrian. She was the youngest daughter of Empress Maria Theresa, the ruler of the Habsburg Empire and Francis I, the Holy Roman Emperor. She was the 15th born of 16 children in just 19 years to Maria Theresa. And Maria Theresa generally ran her family as a business. Each child to her was a political pawn, as most high society children born in Europe were during this time. Each child was an opportunity to make political connections, mend political bridges, make new allies. Strategic marriage alliances could be used to strengthen Austria's position within Europe. And so as soon as each child was considered old enough, generally once the girls got their periods, they would be married off to high society, usually in another country. On one occasion, when daughter Mary Josepha died of smallpox just days before her wedding was due to take place, Maria Theresa simply substituted her for another daughter, Maria Carolina. There was a pretty high mortality rate within the siblings, which is why there were so many of them in the first place. They became emperors and queens, and little Maria Antonia wasn't exactly a special child. It's not like she was her mother's favourite or particularly exceptional growing up. It was just luck that she ended up in France where she did. There was a huge rivalry between the Kingdom of France and the House of Habsburg, the largest and most powerful royal house of the Holy Roman Empire, whose dominion consisted principally of Austria. There were a lot of wars where Austria and France fought against each other, that's a whole other video. Basically, France and Austria were not friends, they didn't get on for hundreds of years. That's until 1756, the beginning of the Seven Years' War, which involved Prussia, Britain, France and Austria. In a very diplomatic move, France and Austria become allies for the first time in over 200 years in order to fight their mutual enemy, Prussia. The alliance is sealed by the marriage of Maria Antonio and Louis XVI of France, something that is decided upon when she is just 11 years old. She was become Queen of France on the side of her future husband, Louis Auguste, 
the grandson of current reigning Louis XV and heir to the French throne. Maria was brought up in the usual way of the Habsburg monarchy, but she wasn't a particularly smart child. She was never really any good at reading or writing, but she was incredibly skilled in music and loved to sing and dance, regularly performing with her siblings for her parents. She had a governess who shared with her sister, Maria Carolina, and the governess was the person in charge of her education for most of her childhood. But once Maria Antonia was betrothed to become the future Queen of France, her intellectual and physical development was followed closely. She undergoes further education and has taught French language and history. Tutors are specially hired from France to help her with her education, and she's trained in how to hold her own at the court of Versailles, vital for anyone in French high society. By the spring of 1770, 14 year old Maria Antonia was deemed ready for marriage. The norm within royal households in the 1700s was for two weddings to take place. First there was a wedding by proxy, which took place on April 19th, 1770 in Vienna. Maria technically married Louis without him even being present. The ceremony and the following banquet took place and her brother, Archduke Ferdinand, served as the proxy groom, saying the groom's vows on his behalf. As weird as it sounds nowadays, it was quite normal at the time. And it was important that when she stepped foot on French soil for the first time, she did so as a married woman, an adult unaccompanied by her Austrian chaperones. In May, the journey to Versailles to meet her husband for the first time begins. But first, Austrian German speaking Maria Antonia had to be Frenchified. Her name is changed to the more French sounding Marie Antoinette and the long journey begins. She is stripped of her Austrian clothes and placed in a French gown. Her Austrian dog is taken away from her as well as any Austrian staff. She is now French. On the afternoon of the 14th of May 1770, the future king and queen finally meet near Compiègne, where the road crossed the river at the Bridge of Bern. The king, Louis XV, arrived in a carriage with his grandson, the future king, and three of his daughters. And it was a successful meeting for the king and 14-year-old Marie Antoinette, at least. He was fully charmed by her and her childish ways, her innocence. He was pretty happy with the union. His grandson, however, was not. Louis Auguste was 15 years old and your typical teenager, moody and sullen, he barely greeted his wife, just with a quick formal embrace. The king would later comment that Marie Antoinette's figure was undeveloped, that she had little bosom, but he deemed it satisfactory enough for her age, because she was just 14 at the time. Her complexion was deemed to be her best feature at the time, she had this white skin, which was this wonderful natural colour to the French, but she had a less fortunate Austrian lip, it's noted. And Marie Antoinette is still noted today as having an unusually long neck. She wasn't a great beauty, but she was considered a pretty girl and that was considered enough. Her husband would show no reaction to her appearance, simply noting in his journal later on that he had met with Madame la Dauphine, his future queen. Many of the members of the royal family would show more excitement over meeting Marie Antoinette than her own husband. The first impressions she made on the French were very good. Wednesday the 16th of May 1770 was the day of the big wedding. Crowns lined the streets of Versailles to get a glimpse of the future king and queen as they made their three hour carriage journey there. She and her ladies got up early to begin the preparations for the wedding, discovering on the day that her wedding dress was actually too small for her. She was the teenager ever growing and the measurements had been sent from Vienna several months earlier. It was this extravagant silver dress adorned with wide pannier hips and white diamonds, but no matter how tight they tried to tie the back of the dress, the lacing and the shift poked out from underneath, this strange gap between the rows of diamonds. The last thing any bride wants on her wedding day is to find out that her dress doesn't fit, especially when literally every eye in France is on you. But there was little that could be done about it. The wedding was to take place regardless. So it did. At the ceremony, Marie Antoinette stands at the side of her husband, showing dignity and graceful self-presentation. She had all of the airs of the royalty she was. Her husband, on the other hand, was still sulky and cold, this huge contrast to his bride. He trembled as he placed the ring on her finger. After the ceremony, it was the signing of the marriage contract, signed by King Louis, then Louis Auguste, and then Marie Antoinette. But as she signed her name, a blot of ink fell, obscuring her signature. She was never really known for her good penmanship, but this was considered to be a sign of bad luck for the marriage. And you can't exactly say that this would prove to be false. 
Next was to come the most important part of the day, the ritual bedding of the couple, which would be followed by the physical consummation of the marriage. They were to have sex and everyone was to know about it. The couple are joined by a crowd as they make their way to the bedchamber. The Archbishop of Rheims blesses the nuptial bed and King Louis himself gave his grandson the nightgown and the Duchess gave Marie Antoinette hers before they each handed them over into the bed. Once they are in bed, everyone in the chamber, although I don't have a precise number, it seemed to have been a lot of people, bows and withdraws from the bedroom. It was expected of the couple to start producing children straight away. They had to consummate the marriage that night. But by the next morning, it became known that these expectations had not been fulfilled. The couple had not been able to consummate the marriage and they wouldn't do so for the next seven years. This became a popular matter of discussion throughout France. Imagine the whole country discussing what goes on in your sex life. It absolutely plagued their reputations. We don't know for sure what the issue was in the bedroom with these two, but the most popular theory is that Louis had a painful medical condition called phimosis, which can make sex very painful for him. Or perhaps they were both just clueless teenagers, not sure exactly what was meant to go where. And it didn't help that Louis just seemed to show very little interest in his wife, and they led very different lives. They barely saw each other. Louis did not particularly enjoy the company of others, whilst Marie Antoinette was busy dazzling the courts of Versailles. She was constantly attending parties late into the night and sleeping in the next day, whilst Louis would go to bed early and get up early to hunt. Marie Antoinette would write to a friend, my tastes are not the same as the king's, who is only interested in hunting and his metalworking. People were not particularly impressed with this couple, but particularly Marie Antoinette's mother, Maria Theresa, who wrote to her daughter telling her to caress her husband more. Maria Theresa was not happy because technically the marriage and the France-Austria alliance didn't count until this couple had consummated. A lot of political stuff sort of laid on the fact that they needed to have sex. As this was a marriage of diplomacy, Maria Theresa couldn't stand for her daughter to fail Austria. Four years after the marriage, Louis XV died of smallpox and Louis Auguste becomes Louis XVI, the King of France. And the couple still hadn't had sex. They were essentially the laughing stock of France at this point. So Maria Theresa sends Marie Antoinette's brother, Joseph, over to France to talk to the couple. We don't know exactly what was said, but apparently Joseph would later report that the two were just complete blunderers and nothing else had stood in their way of consummation. Whatever was said, the couple finally consummated and they later wrote to Joseph thanking him for his help. Marie Antoinette fell pregnant and in December 1778, she gave birth to their daughter at Versailles, Marie Therese Charlotte, a great source of disappointment to the crown who needed a son as an heir. They would go on to have three further children though, including sons. In her first few years in France, opinions were mixed on the future queen. She became known for her love of opulence and luxury. While she was born into royalty and into money, her mother didn't ever allow for the level of extravagance that Marie Antoinette would later encounter in France. And she would just fall in love with this lifestyle. On the day of her wedding, she was spoiled with a trunk full of the most magnificent jewels, diamonds and pearls, and she was just in awe. Luxury would become her biggest vice. She would spend millions on the finest dresses sewn with gold thread and studded with diamonds. She loved the court of Versailles and would regularly attend all of the balls held there. She kept up with the latest fashions or she was the latest fashion. If Marie Antoinette wore something, so would everyone else. Her mother was horrified by this, sending her letter after letter stating that the queen should be understated and demure. She didn't need to be spending so much money on clothing. Marie Antoinette would in return moan to her mother that she hated being dressed by her ladies in waiting and eating her meals in front of the public, saying that she felt like she was constantly being watched all of the time. There was no escape. Marie Antoinette had no privacy. She wrote to her mother, at 11 o'clock I have my hair done. At noon, all of the world can enter. I put on my rouge and wash my hands in front of the whole world. Then the gentlemen leave and the ladies remain and I am dressed in front of them. Another sign of Marie Antoinette's extravagance was her hair. She had this original hairstyle commissioned, her gravity defying poof, which when you think of her today, you still think of that huge mound of hair piled on top of her head, and was often so big that she could hide small vases in her hair that would water the fresh flowers that she styled it with. She literally had vases in her hair. 
She also had her own personal fragrance made from flowers in her own gardens. Her parties and her fashion earned her the moniker Madame Deficit throughout France. The public weren't happy with her spending. She was living this life of opulence whilst the majority of France suffered. Prices of grain were at an all-time high, farmers were suffering, people had no money. Yet here was Marie Antoinette showing off her wealth at every opportunity. In 1774, Louis gifted Marie Antoinette the Petit Trianon. It was a chateau that his grandfather had decided to build in his gardens in 1758. He wanted a new royal residence large enough to house himself and all of his entourage in the grounds of the Palace of Versailles. After he died, Louis XVI handed it over to his new wife. Although their union was rocky to begin with, they did genuinely grow a fondness for each other over the years. And this petite trianon was perfect for Marie Antoinette, who just yearned for privacy, especially in the early years of her marriage. Her bedroom had these mirrored panels that could be raised to obscure the windows, and she could live her life in peace in the petite trianon. Rumours began to circulate that she had plastered the walls with diamonds and gold. But in reality, Marie Antoinette, it seems, wasn't really more extravagant than anyone else in the French court. She was simply stepping into a role that was expected of her. She didn't create this world of luxury. It long predated her arrival in France and the entire royal family spent to excess. People just focused on Marie Antoinette because she was the new one. All eyes were on her, every move she made was speculated, and it probably didn't help that Louis XVI never took on any mistresses. Whilst today, in most relationships, it's considered cheating if a husband sleeps with another woman, it was expected in French society in the 1700s. Marie Antoinette was officially the queen, and her pretty much her only job was to bear children, to provide the king with an heir. And their marriage, as so many were, was arranged for political gain, not personal companionship. Whereas mistresses were actually often chosen because the king liked the person. Mistresses were also important because they gave the public someone to focus on outside of the royal family. If they were gossiping about who the king's latest mistress is, they're not paying too much attention to the queen and the inner workings of the royal family. But seeing as Louis XVI never took a mistress, he actually did kind of like his wife. The only person everyone could talk about was Marie Antoinette. Her entire life was under the telescope. It was well known that the person with the most influence over the king was whoever had his ear. And pillow talk is a place where most talking would happen. And a lot of the time in France, the mistress would be the one to take the blame for any wrongdoings by the king. The mistress is the one who influenced the king to make this bad decision. Because of course, the king was divinely chosen and could do no wrong. It was always the blame of a woman. But again, there was no mistress to blame in Louis XVI's case. The only other woman available was Marie Antoinette, the queen. A quote by historian Caroline Weber states, Marie Antoinette really was beating the brunt of a level of public indignation coupled with misogyny that had traditionally been channeled towards these mistresses. Just as we have tabloids today, the French had their own version in the 1700s. Political pamphlets and books circulated throughout France, many of them pornographic in nature. Historically, the mistresses would be the feature of these pornographic descriptions and drawings, considered promiscuous for sleeping with a married man. But without the mistress, Marie Antoinette was the target of this ridicule. Pornographic, very unflattering images of the Queen circulated around France, and people laughed, insinuated that she slept with many men and women in the court, painting her as immoral. In reality, there was actually very little evidence to suggest that she had any affairs. A king to have a mistress was acceptable, but for a queen to cheat, it was not. There is suggestion today that she actually had an affair with a powerful Swedish statesman called Axel von Fersen, and it's even suggested that her daughter Sophie was illegitimate, the daughter of von Fersen, but Sophie died as an infant. This basically all came out in a book written in 2016 by British historian Evelyn Farr, which explores this apparent affair. She decoded letters between the two which spoke about their love for each other, but I would take this with a pinch of salt. It does seem like this is only really mentioned in this book, and I couldn't really find any other historians who back this up. It is kind of just a theory at this point. And Marie Antoinette and Axel von Fersen do speak of their love for each other, but it may have been platonic. By 1782, the public view of Marie Antoinette had dropped dramatically. 
Even when the union between Marie and Louis was first suggested all those years earlier, there was a lot of backlash because of the animosity between France and Austria over the years. People automatically didn't trust her because she was Austrian and they believed that she would only try and further the politics of Austria in the French court. It was always going to be a challenge to get the French people to like her. At first she was something new, people wanted to see what she was going to do and people did kind of like her at the beginning. But as the French economy got worse, it's almost as if she is personally blamed for it. By 1783 her public image is at its worst. She's portrayed as immoral, ignorant, extravagant and adulterous in the pamphlets. Every single move she makes is criticised. Perhaps the most famous quote attributed to Marie Antoinette is let them eat cake. As the story goes it was apparently the Queen's response upon being told that her starving peasants had no bread. Because cake is more expensive than bread, it's often cited as an example of how oblivious Marie Antoinette was to the conditions and daily lives of other people. It was a callous remark. But actually, Marie Antoinette never said this, and it doesn't mean what it was taken to mean at all. For one thing, the original French phrase was actually, and I'm going to use Google Translate to help me here so I don't embarrass myself, it was... Qu'il mange de la brioche which directly translates to let them eat cake, but more specifically, let them eat brioche. There was actually a law in France around this time which stated that if a baker ran out of bread to sell to the peasants, he has to lower the cost of his brioche to the same price as the bread, so the peasants wouldn't go hungry. Brioche back then isn't as fancy as we think of it today, it was essentially just a type of egg-based bread, slightly more fancy than your standard flour and water bread. If somebody was saying, let them eat brioche, it was most likely a positive thing, let the peasants eat the brioche. But it wasn't Marie Antoinette who said this. In book 6 of French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Confessions, written around 1767, he attributes this quote to a great princess, and although Marie Antoinette was alive and a princess at the time, she was still a young child, so it's very unlikely that it was her that Rousseau had in mind. But the revolutionaries in France at the time, looking for every reason to discredit the monarchy, are said to have took this quote and falsely attributed it to Marie Antoinette, spreading it as propaganda in the pamphlets. Although, on the other side, a lot of historians say that revolutionaries never did this. So it's not entirely clear why this was ever attributed to Marie Antoinette. It's just a false rumour that has persisted over hundreds of years. By 1787, France is on the brink of bankruptcy and the Controller General of Finances can't come up with an acceptable solution. He's removed from his post and replaced, but the nation still continues to teeter on the edge of bankruptcy. So the king dissolves the assembly of notables after they refuse to give up traditional tax exemptions. The king and the queen are trying to do stuff to help. For the next year, 1788, there's a poor harvest, so grain prices rise and people begin to hoard for the winter. The French public are growing restless, they have literally nothing. Whilst the royalty are still showing off all of their wealth, the people have nothing. In reality, the treasury was actually already empty by the time Louis XVI took the throne, but they needed somebody to blame and the monarchy is the obvious choice here and you can't blame them, the monarchy are meant to look after them, but instead, the people are starving, the monarchy are still all rich. It's actually well documented though that Marie Antoinette was a very charitable woman, especially after the birth of her children. Although this was an example that Marie and Louis set from the beginning of their marriage. For example, during the fireworks which celebrated their marriage in May 1774, there was a stampede and many people were killed, over a hundred people died. Marie and Louis gave all of their private spending money for a year to relieve the suffering of the victims and their families. Because of this, they're actually quite well liked the first few years before it all started to go downhill. In Marie's own circle, she was actually known to be a very sweet woman. She adopted several orphans, paying for their education and welfare, taking several to the palace to actually live with her. In 1776, she was out for a carriage ride when a four or five year old boy ran out in front of the horses. The boy screams and his grandmother comes running out and tells the queen that the boy's mother had just died and left four children in her care. The queen immediately adopts this boy and pays for the rest of the children and takes the boy to the palace with her. Rumour has it though that this boy was a very difficult child and later turned against his adoptive family when the revolution came. But he was just one of many. In 1787 the queen was presented with gifts from Senegal, a parrot and a young Senegalese boy for her to take as a slave. But she refused and instead adopted this boy as her own, paying for his education. During the famine of 87-88, the royal family sold many of their possessions to buy grain for the people and themselves only ate cheap barley breads. 
But the French public saw it as the damage had already been done. Too little, too late. The royals had been spending the French money frivolously for years. It didn't matter what they did now. By 1789, the French Revolution had begun. The full revolution will be a whole other video at some point, but in very simple terms, it was a period of 10 years in which the people overthrew the monarchy and took control of the government. It really started on June 14th, 1789, when the revolutionaries stormed the Bastille. And in the days following this, many members of high society began emigrating out of the country. The king remained though, and Marie Antoinette remained by his side. And even though over the next couple of years his power was slowly diminished, Marie Antoinette focused on caring for her children. But she also played a very important role in the early years of the revolution. She relied on her personal relationships with many key actors of the revolution to help her and her family survive. It was just all about survival. One of these was the Marquis de Lafayette. Any Hamilton fans out there will know the key role Lafayette played in the American Revolutionary War, but he also played a very important part in the French Revolution as well. Lafayette didn't really want the fall of the monarchy, but rather the establishment of a more liberal one, similar to the UK's. So him and Marie Antoinette maintained a very cordial relationship for the sake of both their causes. Only of course, Marie Antoinette was accused of having an affair with the Marquis de Lafayette, even though it's very well documented they actually did not like each other at all. It was just a very platonic friendship, they were just kind of using each other for their gains. For a long time, the king and queen refused to escape France, even though their situation was kind of getting worse by the day, but they weren't about to give up. Marie Antoinette begins meeting with the Comte de Mirabeau, who was the most important lawmaker in the French assembly at the time. And like Lafayette, he was a liberal aristocrat. He wasn't necessarily against the monarchy, he just wanted to reconcile it with the revolution. So him and Marie Antoinette open up a secret negotiation and they agree to meet. Mirabeau was very impressed by the Queen. He liked her a lot. She offered to pay him 600 livres per month and 1 million if he succeeded in his mission to restore the King's authority. However, he ended up dying suddenly in April 1791 without securing his promise. So Louis and Marie Antoinette have no choice but to put their plan to escape into action. They'd been advised to escape quietly with two light carriages, slip out without anybody seeing, which is the idea of any good escape plan. But Marie Antoinette's need for luxury foiled her once again, when she insisted on keeping the family together in a huge coach complete with silver dinner service and a small wine chest. The family tried to slip out of Paris on the evening of June 20th, 1791, disguised as servants, and helped out by none other than Count Axel von Fersen, the man who may or may not have been having an affair with Marie Antoinette. They get as far as Varennes, 130 miles east of Paris, where a band of armed villagers accost the king. They'd recognised him, and soon the family had traipsed back to Paris by the assembly. Any remaining support the monarchy had from the French public was destroyed when they made this attempt to flee the country. For the moment, the assembly allowed Louis to remain on the throne as little more than a figurehead. He had no actual power. Marie Antoinette spends her time secretly lobbying for a constitutional monarchy and she writes to all the other European leaders asking them to support them. Louis detested the new constitution, but in September 1791 takes an oath to uphold it, which is pretty much the only thing at this point keeping him alive. In April, under pressure from the assembly, Louis declares war on Austria, who were preparing to invade France to restore Alsace and obtain full liberty for the royal family. Basically, Marie Antoinette's family were wanting to save her, and the French weren't too happy about it, especially when the Austrians started defeating them at every turn on the battlefield. They suspected that the king and the queen were plotting with the enemy, plotting with Austria, passing on military secrets. Which they kinda were. On August 10th, an armed mob stormed the Tullier where the family was staying. They attempt to escape, but the assembly vote to have the king, queen and their family locked up in the Temple Tower, a medieval fortress in the centre of Paris. On September 20th, the new Revolutionary National Convention meet for the first time, the successor to the assembly, the New France. And by the following day, the 1,000 year old monarchy is abolished and the Republic is established. For the next two months, the family are locked up in the Temple Tower. The king and queen pass the time by schooling their children, until in November, a bunch of letters from Louis to foreign powers plotting a counter-revolution are found in a box hidden in the Tullier. Louis is taken from his family and locked up on a different floor. On December 26th, he's put on trial. It's proclaimed that Louis must die so the country may live. 
he'd conspired against the state. And whilst many argue that the family should have just been exiled to America, he was condemned to death. On the 21st of January 1793, he's led to the guillotine and executed before a crowd of 20,000 people. Marie and her family remained locked up for the next six months, but she was eventually transferred to the Conciergerie, a prison which was dubbed Death's Antechamber. The same month, a former officer comes to visit her and he drops at her feet a carnation, containing a note that he would try to save her. A guard spots this note, and once it comes out the royalists are plotting to free the Queen, she's immediately put on trial for treason and theft, as well as a very false and disturbing charge of sexual abuse against her own son. Unknown to the Queen, the new government had been holding her son, Louis Charles, in terrible conditions, and had forced him to testify that his mother had behaved inappropriately with him. Though throughout most of the accusations on trial, she remained very calm and collected, she said that she was calm as she knew her conscience was clear, when she heard about this testimony from her son, she reacts. She says, I thought that human nature would excuse me from answering such an imputation, but I appeal from it to the heart of every mother here present. She gets emotional and her emotion affects all the other women in the courtroom. Even these people who hated her felt heartbroken at how upset she was over being accused of harming her son. Her trial would last 32 hours over two days and her defence was given just less than 24 hours to prepare. Early on the 16th of October, she was declared guilty of the three main charges against her. Depletion of the National Treasury, conspiracy against the security of the state, and high treason. She was condemned to death for her crimes, and she was not allowed to see her children to prepare for execution. She's changed into a plain white dress and her hair is shaved and her hands are bound behind her back. She's forced to sit in an open cart from the jail to the guillotine waiting for her at the place of the revolution. It was an hour long journey, the crowds lined the streets to abuse her, to throw stuff at her. Even the king had been allowed to travel to his execution in private, but Marie Antoinette, the queen, was put on display for all to see. On the 16th of October, 1793, at 12.15pm, Marie Antoinette was guillotined. Her last words were, pardon me sir, I did not do it on purpose, after she accidentally stepped on the executioner's shoe. Her body was unceremoniously thrown into an unmarked grave in the Madeleine Cemetery located close by. She was exhumed and given a proper burial years later. Thomas Jefferson famously once said, I have ever believed that if there had been no queen, there would have been no revolution, which points out just how hated Marie Antoinette was by the French public. But as we now know, the treasury was already pretty empty by the time Louis XVI and Marie took the throne. France was going to struggle financially whether or not Marie had married Louis. If it wasn't her, it probably would have been somebody else. The French public were poor and frustrated and angry and Marie was kind of a scapegoat for that anger. She represented everything they hated about the monarchy, the luxury, the opulence, and no matter how much good she did, she was never going to be liked. I'd be really interested to hear from my French viewers on this one. What's the general view of Marie Antoinette in France nowadays? Is she still hated? Do people feel sorry for her? From my research on this video, I can't help but feel sorry for her. This 14 year old girl thrown into a life that she never could have prepared for. But maybe the truth goes deeper than that. I'm obviously not French. I didn't grow up in France. I wasn't taught about this growing up. So I don't know the actual French opinion on this. Although I am 19% French according to my 23andMe. Fun fact. So yes, I would love to hear from my French viewers on this. What is your opinion on Marie Antoinette? Let me know if you've got anybody else you'd like me to talk about in this series. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.